welcome to High Flyers with me, Russell Walker, on the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for free by clicking the big red button down there and then the bell to get you notified of great new content every week. Now, my guest on the show is a man who is no stranger to life under the spotlight. He's one of Scotland's most high profile football referees who's just taken charge of his third Old Firm match. He combines refereeing with a career at ScotRail. John Beaton is with us. And John, why did you want to be a referee? I mean, I started refereeing in 1997, um, which, is, which is a lifetime ago. Um, I, I used to go to watch football with my dad, just amateur football, and, and we used to watch my cousin play. He got a bad injury and started uh, refereeing. Um, and then we found ourselves going to watch him refereeing. Um, and he said, why... You continue to do this, why don't you try it for yourself? Um, so I did. Um, I was still at school, I took the referee course, um, and I was doing games on a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning. And before I knew it, um, I was progressing through through the grades, um, and it was always kind of running alongside with what I was doing in terms of uh, initially at school uh, and then moving on from that into university. Um, it was a good balance. The, the other guys uh, that I was on the course with had part-time jobs and places like Blockbuster Video and, and pubs and coffee shops. And um, for me, I was able to be sort of free the whole week uh, and then a couple of games at the weekend and I was getting a level of income to allow me to be a student, um, which was good. Were you any good at football? Uh, I mean, I, I was all right at football. Um, I played with the school team and, and I played the boys' clubs up until uh, sort of under 16, under 17 level. Um, so I would have probably kept playing and I would have probably played amateur football. I might have been lucky enough to play in the very, very lower levels of junior football and if I'd stuck at it. But I, I wasn't, wasn't gifted by any stretch of the imagination and I certainly would never have reached the level that I have done in refereeing uh, if I was still playing. Is that important, John, being able to, to play the game or, or is it just enough to know the rules of the game and have, obviously have an understanding of, of what goes on in a pitch between players? One of the big criticisms that is that referees don't have the feel for the game because they've never played the game. And how can you know if you've never played at the highest level? And I don't think it's important to have played at the highest level, but I think it's important to understand football um, and to have a, a general feel for what makes a good game and, and what contributes to a game being bad. Um, uh, the object for the referee is to stay out of the way. Uh, and if nobody's talking about you after a game, then you've done the right thing. So I, I certainly think having played the game and, and being a fan and watching football certainly helps you uh, with that. And I don't think you can just learn the laws of the game and just go on to the park and apply them because it doesn't work like that. You need you need a wee bit more. We always used to refer to it as a hobby, um, which was very naive of us um, back in the day to, to say that because it very quickly overtakes your life and actually becomes way, way, way much more than that. Um, in some ways, it's harder than, than being a full-time professional because we have professional uh, careers as well. We have full-time jobs and we need to apply ourselves professionally uh, as football referees. So it's very, very difficult to do both um, and to achieve that sort of kind of professional status um, uh, and act and, and, and present yourself as a professional when you've got a full-time occupation too. Um, I think we've probably seen the introduction of more... Um, speed into the game uh, and there's a there's a much greater demand on fitness you can see that from from the players you can see that there's a more athletic uh, feel for the game and it's certainly something we've had to move along with and uh, the game is probably much faster than it ever was um, there are more female referees involved we have a we have a few in, in scotland that are doing really well uh, in women's football and, and european level um, which is great to see and it's great to see that they're involved in the in the men's game as well um, so uh, aye, but there are—I mean, there are so many aspects. It's an almost unrecognisable um, game since when I first started in uh, 1997, which really is such a long time ago now. Well, being Scotland, of course, there's loads of football teams, but there is really only one game for a referee, uh, I guess, to to measure himself or herself eventually against, and that would be an old firm match. What is that like to be out in the middle in an old firm match? I mean, it is a very unique experience to be involved in it. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to referee three uh, of the matches now, uh, and one, of course, recently without spectators, which was a totally different environment. But uh, it's a sought-after game uh, throughout uh, Europe and probably indeed the world. But when we meet our colleagues from 
from other countries and on our travels in UEFA matches, they always ask about the match. They always ask if you've refereed it. Um, they're always uh, asking questions about the intensity of it. And, and I think it's something that they would absolutely love to come and be a part of. And, and both sides of the, uh, the, the, the match, both uh, Celtic and Rangers fans would absolutely love to have foreign referees as well. So I think everybody wants it apart from us. Um, but uh, I, it's, it's just so um, sought after. It's something that's talked about. It's more than a game, really. The 90 minutes itself um, doesn't present itself as, as more of a challenge than the top European games that we do. But it's everything that comes along with it, um, from the appointment is made uh, the week before the match, the whole week of scrutiny, and then usually at least a week after it as well. So you've got that two-week bubble. Um, of being in the old firm uh, uh, environment, which is which is very unique. You just don't get that way anything else. Um, and it really is an occasion. Uh, it's a special feeling to be a part of it. Um, and better referees than me, much better referees than me, have not uh, been fortunate enough to get the opportunity to referee them. So you really do uh, pinch yourself when you get the opportunity to be appointed to them. And, and it's great that I've managed to do three, and, and hopefully there's more to come. I remember famously Hugh Dallas being struck by a coin. I can't remember the year now, but but the early two thousands perhaps. Uh, one old firm match. That's that's unusual, but at the same time it does show the the intensity on the pitch from I guess from the fans. How difficult is that to cope with? It's not just the players, is it? It's the fans as well that you have to deal with. I I mean the spectators in any kind of high profile match. Again, it's not just restricted to Scotland, but we go away to some of the more hostile environments in, in Europe and going to the likes of Serbia um, and Croatia and, and, and then Greece and Turkey and these places where they really do have fanatical uh, support um, in the stadiums. And it can be just as difficult in these places as, as, as uh, in, in the old firm match. But I have to say when you blow the whistle, um, you are very much aware of the, the fans, but you do tune in to what's on the pitch. And, and for that 90 minutes, you really are focused. Um, it would be... Um, It'd be wrong to say that you're you're not not aware um, of the the intensity of the the support, but it doesn't really influence you in any way. Um, you get so used to it when you get to that level. I mean, having refereed for so long, you've done so many top matches before you finally get to do that um, that the, 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 the biggest match we have in this country. But you're not a newbie. You're not you're not getting in making your, your debut in refereeing. You might be making your debut in the match, but you've pretty much experienced everything you possibly can up until that point. Um, and although that is a wee step up, you're, you're very very much prepared for it. And it would be the same for a player making his debut in that match. It would be massive for him, but he's hardly getting in there as a rookie. Uh, he's, he's done a lot of hard work to get to that point to be ready for it. So you mentioned the fans are not specifically an influence. How about the players? I mean, I'd love you to mention names. I understand if you can't, but what are some of the techniques players use to try and get you to change a decision, get someone sent off, intimidate you when you're out on the pitch? Yeah. Well, I just think they react to the fans, don't they? They react to the noise of the fans and also they influence the fans as well by reacting themselves. And I think you're seeing that uh, with no spectators in the stadium. You don't get the same um, intense reaction from the players. I, I don't. I don't recall watching a match in, in Scotland this season or indeed refereeing one in, um, where the players have surrounded the referee for a decision. I can't remember it happening. It certainly not happened in my matches and, and none of the live matches that I've seen uh, have presented uh, challenges like that. Um, and that's no coincidence um, that the players feed off the spectators and that's only right. That's the, that's, that's the way it should be. Um, and also there's probably some things that they do to try and get the fans uh, behind them as well. Uh, maybe putting in a strong tackle or um, uh, maybe maybe doing something like that, approaching the referee or challenging an opponent, but um, there's little or no value in that now because they don't get the reaction from the spectators and you've not got 50, 60,000 people cheering after you do it, so it's maybe taking that wee element out of the game and, and to be honest, the sooner that comes back the better, um, because everybody wants that, everybody wants to feel that passion in the match and I think that's been slightly lost during the, the, the times that we're operating at the moment. Is there a case for Having pro referees in Scotland, I know they've got them in England, and some of them are earning two hundred grand a year plus. I, I mean, it just comes down to finances, really. Um, I think that in Scotland we're not as well off as, as some of the other countries. Certainly, done in, in England, they've got quite a lot of money kicking around, and other European countries are the same. I mean, we would like it. Um, it would be better if we had more time to focus on refereeing and preparation and recovery. But um, it's just a nature of, of where we are at the moment. 
you talked a lot about Scottish uh, football and refereeing here. What's it like refereeing uh, in Europe or refereeing international matches? Do they change? Is, is, are there different things you have to think about? Apart from the language, I guess. I, I, I mean, the language barrier is one, but the European matches, it's just a great experience. It's just great to be involved, to travel Europe, to to get on that plane and, and, and set off and, and represent Scotland and, and try and do a good job. Um, fortunate. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to go to some really, really high-profile uh, venues, some high-profile matches. Um, your approach is, is really no different. I mean, you, you need to go and, and get a feel for the match and, and referee and keep control of it. Uh, and that's uh, the most important thing, is having the control of the match. And the, the added element is that the players don't know you. Um, you're a bit of a stranger to them. Um, so you've not really got the, the fallback that you have in Scotland, where they would pretty much recognise you. They've lost seen you before. You've got a head start there. They know you're one of the top referees, so you've got a bit of respect there. And you probably need to earn that quite quickly uh, in the European matches, um, especially when you step up a level and you go and referee some of the top teams and uh, maybe see you're from Scotland and, and never heard of you before. So um, it's a slightly different dynamic, but um, it's just a great experience to go and, and be in another country and, and see another style of football. It's, it's something you'll never get tired of being involved in. I suppose you might know some players in, in a European match because they may have played in Scotland, but maybe more likely in an international match is because they, they come from all over the world. So what's that like when you, you, know, you walk out and most of the, the, the players are strangers to you, but you maybe, you maybe do know one or two from their time in Scotland? Does that help? No. Or, or I, or of course it does. It? I mean, that, no, that's, that's a really good thing to, to see a familiar face uh, in an environment like that. I refereed Croatia and Sweden quite recently, and uh, Mikhail Lustig uh, plays with Sweden, and obviously I've refereed him uh, a lot, quite a lot uh, when he was in Scotland, so he was speaking to me. Um, and funnily enough, it was the Saturday, it was the match was just before the Old Firm match, and he was asking me about that. He'd said he'd seen that I'd been appointed to it and asked if I was looking forward to it. So it shows you that they're still keeping in touch with the Scottish game as well. But no, it's good to see a familiar face. Um, I think it helps because undoubtedly he would then comment to the other players that he, that he knows you. It um, might not be a favourable comment, but at least then they know that you're operating at a good level as well. So it is nice to see a, a familiar face in it. And, and I'd always make the, the, the point, if I could, get an opportunity to say hello to them and, and see how they're getting on. We don't have VAR in Scotland, uh, video assistant referee. Is that something that you regret, or I mean, I know there's a cost element to it, obviously, but is, is that something you'd like to see in, in in the Scottish game? I definitely. I mean, I think it just comes down to cost uh, as well. We talked about professionalism, um, and it really finances dictate everything in that respect. Um, it would be great to have it in Scotland. I think, if for no other reason than we need to have the same standing as the other European countries, um, we can't expect realistically to be held in the same regard as is some of the top leagues in the world if we don't have the same um, basic uh, standard for facilities and, um, and VAR is a huge, huge part of that these days. Um, so if that could be uh, introduced, um, if, we could, if we could get VAR into the match, it would be a huge boost for the referees and, and I think it would be a boost for the teams as well. Um, there obviously there is a dynamic at the moment where the top clubs would be going away and potentially using the VAR in European matches, but then coming back to domestic football and not having it. And that's something that, uh, if it is introduced in the Europa League next year, then we really need to try and avoid that if we can. There's potential for, for lots of um, mistakes, even with VAR. Uh, and also, you've got the added burden as, as a referee, I guess, of, of rule changes coming in. You know, probably every season there's a little tweak here or there. And then you've got somebody as respected as Arsene Wenger coming in with what would be quite major um, changes to the laws, the offside law, uh, kick-ins instead of throw-ins in your own half, free kicks taken to yourself. How, how do you feel about those kind of changes and, and how easy is it to adapt? I mean, if the change benefits the game, then it's worthwhile. Um, I think the most recent one that that really kind of changed football and, and how it even looks on the pitch is the, the ball not having to leave the, the penalty area, uh, they taking a goal kick and, and a free kick. And that's, I, I can remember us chatting about this before it got introduced and being quite sceptical because it just looks quite alien uh, to see that. Um, but now you see it's actually massively changed the way that teams play the game because they, they set up with two players inside the penalty area, almost at the edge of the goal area. The six yard box for uh, to, 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 to give it its well known title, but they, they stand there and they then they pass it around, and you could have five or six passes before it comes at the penalty area. And we kind of thought, oh my god, this is going to be um, 
a bit crazy when it comes in, um, but it's it's changed the style of play. So it's obviously it's obviously something that the teams are happy with and the, the players have embraced. So anything that can improve the game is is fine by us. I don't want to get any strong feelings one way or another uh, on whether something should change. Um, I think that's a good example of where um, something has improved the game. What about the five substitutes rule? Is that something you're in favour of? I think, I mean, I think it's good for the the teams. I think in the environment that we're operating in at the moment, and maybe an increased schedule, um, more matches and things. I think it's it's entirely appropriate for the well being of the players, um, and it certainly helps teams um, with the amount of matches they've got. In terms of the actual match itself, it probably breaks it up a wee bit more. Um, what I have kind of found, and I, I did think this in my European game recently that more of a friendly feel to it towards the end of a match if you're getting five subs made. Um, one of the big complaints of friendly matches is that there are too many stoppages. Um, so we still only have three subs being made, but five five players changing is quite a lot uh, from a starting eleven. Um, so that's probably the one drawback of it, that it can kind of stifle the, the flow of the match, uh, late in the match. Um, but I think where we are at the moment and in, in the environment that we operate in, it's entirely appropriate that we, we allow the team's extra subs. So you're in the pub with your pals. The conversation inevitably comes round to football. Is that a conversation you just want to tiptoe away from, or do you do you join in? I I mean, the very nature of it is that that I've been a referee for so long that they all know uh, my views on certain things, uh, and and we are where we are. We are. So there are certain topics where they get involved in, but you obviously always get messages. They'll see high-profile incidents uh, in England, or they'll see an incident in Scotland, and, and they'll send you a message and saying, "Tell us the right answer for this, or what do you think of this?" So, um, it probably changes them as well. Though I know that uh, some of my work colleagues and, and some of my friends, it changes the way they they watch the match. Particularly if I'm refereeing the match, because they'll pay more attention to to what I'm doing, um, and they'll probably have a wee bit more vested interest in the refereeing decisions for for a different reason than they normally would. So, I think it changes the way. Uh, my friends watch the match uh, and they certainly kind of see it in a different way um, and I think because they get my perspective on it then, then it does mellow them a little towards any uh, refereeing decisions um, particularly uh, when it comes to Scotland matches and, and even though I'm desperate for Scotland to win I'm still balanced about the referee uh, and can try and throw them off the ledge sometimes. I'm going to ask you about your career highlights just in a moment but what about the lowlights what about the things that have have really kind of you know brought you down in the game? I mean, refereeing is a uh, there's very little in between. It's either uh, incredible highs uh, or crushing lows. Um, there is never it, it never gets easier making a high profile error um, and having to come off the pitch. And it used to be you you at least get a bit of respite and you had to wait for a Sunday sports scene to know if you've made an error. But um, thanks to the wonderful world of social media, you often know within five minutes if you made an error or not. That will never get easier. Um, you prepare your whole week, you train five days a week, you get yourself ready for the match uh, and you want to go and do well. And when you make a mistake, it will never, ever uh, get easy. To, it's to so public, John. Do. It's so public. It you know, you, you, there's no escape, no high <coughs> space. Yeah. Um, and the flip side of that is that there are some incredible highs, uh, getting the big appointments in, being appointed to cup finals, being appointed to old firm matches and getting those European trips where you get the opportunity to go away, see some of Europe, um, go to some of the biggest stadiums um, and mingle with <coughs> some superstar players. Um, and it's just great to have that, to, to be involved at that level. And as much as you'll never get used to the crushing lows, uh, you can never get enough of those those highs that can come your way. Two last questions. First one, um, what would you like to see change in the game <coughs> if you could wave a magic wand? What, what kind of rule changes would you like to see, do you think? I mean, I think the big one this season that's caused a lot of problems is, is handball. Um, I would like to see some kind of um, simplification of the law. Um, I think we've, tr we've tried to do that this year. Um, and uh, as referees, we probably are in as good a place as we have been with our own understanding of it. But that quite clearly hasn't made its way to the to the public because uh, there's still quite a lot of... Um, dissatisfaction out there with, with how it's been handled and we're applying the law as it is at the moment but it's probably not quite landing so I don't know what the change would be for it I really really don't know it remains one of the most difficult things to apply and particularly at real time to actually detect the handball in itself is is problematic enough with it then having to detect whether it hit a certain part of the arm and what exactly where the arm was and uh, all the other factors that you need to consider so if that could be simplified in some way then 
I would welcome that, but I don't know that anybody knows the answer to how to achieve that. And finally, I guess, what are your ambitions for the future? Well, I mean, I think I'm, at the, I'm certainly approaching the latter stages of my career, which some of the fans will be delighted to, to hear. Um, I think at 38 now, I, I mean, I, I would love to continue to be involved in the top matches. I've been really, really lucky uh, to do uh, and achieve as much as I had done when I set out all those years ago. I would never have expected even probably realistically to be in the Premier, the Premier League in Scotland, the top division. And the fact that I'm now sitting here with probably 160, 170 odd matches and and to have managed to travel around Europe, it's uh, some still something you need to remind yourself that you've actually managed to achieve. So, um, I just I would like to see it out the way that, that I'm operating at the moment. I'd, I'd like to stay at the top level for as long as I can and and get some more European trips in and, and tick off some more big matches domestically um, before it's time to pass pass over the reins to, to someone younger coming through. John Beaton, thank you so much. Thankfully, you've not given me a yellow card or a red card. So thank you for that. And uh, it's been brilliant to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us on High Flyers. No bother. Thanks very much. Cheers.